back live in the BNH virtual event space, National Parks at Night, joining us today. So I want to welcome Matt Hill and Chris Nicholson. Uh, this is obviously, as you see, sponsored by the Night Photo Summit. We're talking night photography. For you know, there's there's rare times when I don't feel you know as comfortable as the guests that we're having on. Matt and Chris are, are making me feel a little. I'm getting a little jittery, a little nervous here because I know it's seasoned pros right here. So I'm gonna do my best to get the heck out of the driver's seat as quick as possible. But we got a, a wonderful hour for you guys. If you guys have never heard them speak, never learned from them, never been to any of the workshops, you really are in for a treat this next hour and change. Um, we're talking tips for solving your night photography problems. So as people like me know very well, you can't just go out and no matter how well you think you take photos and take amazing pictures at night, there is a rhyme and a reason for why there are guys like Matt and Chris that do it so well. And we're going to get into that today. Without further ado, the National Parks at Night guys, Matt and Chris, take it away. Thank you, Derek. Uh, appreciate it. Um, thanks for having us at the event space. Uh, always love presenting there. Um, hi, uh, I'm down in uh, Charlotte right now. Matt, uh, you're up in uh, Catskill? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to share my screen and uh, Matt will get us started here. Okay. Take it away, Matt. All right. So Chris and I have been shooting together for, my gosh, six years more now. And Boy, we're, we're, we've really come down to the point where we've distilled the most common night photography problems because we have to express them uh, in an educational format to people every night. Uh, so what we've done here is taken our top 10 and we're presenting them to you. And how to solve them. Oh yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we did just the 10 problems, um, that'd be a teaser. Um, it would be fun. Yeah. But, uh, Stay tuned for part two. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So um, we're here uh, uh, representing the, the Night Photo Summit, which has been pretty exciting. Um, Matt, you want to tell us about this? I would be delighted. So we were talking about doing something more in person and with the larger community uh, for almost three years now. We've been dreaming of doing an in-person summit. Uh, current circumstances uh, caused us to take a little zag on that. And we built this amazing virtual summit, which is focused only on night photography. We've gathered 30 speakers. Uh, some of them are friends of ours. Some of them are people we admire. Uh, not all of them are night photographers. Some of them are scientists. Some of them are park rangers. Uh, some of them are experts in another field and some are filmmakers, right? So you've got over 40 hours of presentations over three days. It's February 12th through 14th coming up very soon. There's also image reviews. There's panel discussions, including uh, women in night photography, uh, tales from the field, and some virtual parties, which I'm sure you're, you know, Gabe would love to be a part of that. He loves to party. Uh, and a very special film screening. So all of this is packed into one place. Uh, we've worked very hard on it. We're really proud of it. We hope that you check it out. Yeah, and that's, uh, Jesus, eight days away? Is it, eight geez, days. it's eight days away. It's really soon. Uh, yeah, February 12th to the 14th, so. All right, uh, we are excited. We're gonna be talking that whole weekend about night photography, which is also what we are talking about today. Um, so 10 night photography problems and how to solve them. Uh, here is a rundown of what we're going to be covering over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, so 10 problems. One, I can't see my way around, uh, right? As a big problem when you're shooting in the dark is it's dark out. Uh, I lose my tripod in the dark. My exposures look great on my LCD, but then they're dark on my computer. Big problem, especially for people just uh, starting out in night photography, and we're going to cover that. Uh, my light painting looks flat and featureless. The Milky Way, North Star, Moon, whatever you have, is where I want it for my shot. My moonlit photos look like daylight. My night photos have a lot of noise. My Milky Way photos don't pop like the ones on Instagram. Light pollution is ruining the scene or light, clouds, fog, rain is ruining my sky. Okay, so this is what we're gonna cover. Um, I'm gonna talk about the first five and uh, Matt is going to talk about the 
uh, numbers six through 10. So let's get into it. Problem number one, I can't see my way around, right? It is dark when we're out shooting, especially if you're out shooting uh, under a new moon, trying to grab some Milky Way photos. Uh, you know, shooting a new moon is when you get the really, really dark skies and you get a ton of stars. But yeah, it's a problem. You can't always see, especially when you get out into the national parks and some of these places like Death Valley and Big Bend and Great Basin, which are just in some of the darkest places in the United States. So what's the solution? You got to scout in daylight. I can't stress enough how much of a leg up you give yourself when you get out in daylight and take a look around um, before your night shoot. Uh, so this is going to allow you to do different things. Uh, one, I mean, you, you figure out where you can stand, right? You figure out where you can set up your tripod. Um, you can uh, you can just see everything better. You know where to walk. If you're going to be doing any light painting, uh, moving around uh, to get into the scene and add some light painting or even just to walk from spot to spot, it's a lot easier to do that in daylight. And it's a lot easier to do that at night when you've already done it in daylight, right? So get familiar with the area. Uh, it can also help you figure out where to focus. So that's another thing uh, we're not getting into today, but that's another night photography problem, right? Is how do you focus when you can't see? Well, one way to do it is to get out in daylight and focus then. So you can uh, autofocus and then tape down your focus ring and then turn off your autofocus. You could do that. Or um, even just uh, if you've got manual focus lens, you know, you can measure things out about where you want to focus and take notes. Uh, and all of that's a ton easier in the dark. And finally, it is so much easier to compose in daylight when you can actually see your scene. So if you're getting out in daylight, then you can, you can get an idea of what your photos are going to be. And then when you get there at night, you'll already know. It's just going to make it so much easier to get that night shot. Uh, I'll even go so, so far as sometimes to like, you know, take my phone or my iPad and actually do some test photos while I'm daylight scouting. And then at night, I can kind of scroll through them and say, okay, right, right. That's how I wanted to compose it. And then even though it's completely dark out, it only takes maybe one or two test shots to find that composition again. So uh, here's an example. This is up in North Cascades National Park in Washington State. And I thought this could make a really cool night photo. It's kind of facing northish, and there's this waterfall coming down on the cliff right next to this S curve in the road. Um, so this was easy enough in daylight, but if you take a close look around the ground, this is not the easiest place to walk. There's kind of a little bit of fa a fall off there. There's wet rocks. Uh, in order to light paint, in order to get far enough out of the scene, I was going to have to get into the road. Um, so doing all this ahead of time in daylight made it a lot easier to plan all that. I could figure out my composition. I could see, you know, make sure I was in a spot where I could see the road well. Um, I knew um, all the spots. I mean, I must have practiced walking back and forth 20 times. So I knew the spots where there was a bigger drop off. I knew where to avoid the rocks. Uh, you can't see it in this photo, but I'm standing at some really tall grass with some rocks in it. So I knew all of that. So by the time I got to night, to execute the photo, I already knew everything, right? Because I had done all of this work in daylight already. So there you go. Tip number one, get out in daylight and scout all of that stuff that's going to make your nighttime experience just a ton easier. Problem number two, I lost my tripod. Uh, not a big problem because you just go to B&H and buy another one, right? Uh, okay, so maybe we don't want to do that. Uh, here's an issue. So if you're out in the dark working, uh, and you start to get into long exposures. And I say you're doing star trails uh, and you want to do like a one hour exposure, two hour, three hour. I think uh, Gabe did like a five or six hour exposure once. The longer that shot is, the less like you are, likely you are to just hang around the tripod, right? You're probably going to walk away. You're either going to go for a walk or what I usually do is I take a second setup and I go somewhere else to do a light painting shot or just something different while that long exposure is running. Well, if it's a really dark area and a dark night, it could be hard to find your tripod again. Now, if it's someplace really obvious, like at the edge of a, an overlook with a name on it, you know, and a sign and all that, well, that's easy enough. But if you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's not always really obvious landmarks. So how do you find your tripod uh, when you walk away? Well, what I like to do is put a light on it. Uh, there's tons of things. I mean, all of us are carrying, you know, especially when we're shooting these days, we've got six, eight, 10 things on us that have a light on it. 
Uh, my favorite is using a little uh, geotagger that I have. And I just hang that right on my tripod. It's got this little flashing LED. It's not bright enough to uh, ruin my exposure, but it is bright enough to see from far away. So remember, a lot of these places that we're going to do night photography are really dark. Like this is in Death Valley, right at the edge of the racetrack playa. There was one time a few years ago that I had set up a long exposure about a mile out into the racetrack playa, and it was just way too cold to wait. So what we did is we walked back to the car and from one mile away, it was so dark there, I could just barely make out that LED flashing in the dark so that when I walked back out to get the camera, I didn't have to walk around looking for it. I was able to spot exactly where it was, especially the closer I got. So it doesn't have to be a geo tracker. Uh, it could be you know anything that makes just a little bit of light. Um, we have a, a guy who uh, comes on some of our workshops who uses glow tape, he wraps that around. The, uh, one of his tripod legs. Uh, anything that's just going to allow you to find that tripod when it's dark out uh, without scattering so much light that it ruins your exposure. Problem number three, my exposures look great on my LCD, but then they're too dark on the computer. This is a very common problem when people first start out in night photography. And there's two primary reasons why this happens. So I'm gonna tell you both and tell you how to fix them. One way is to turn down your LCD and the other way is to use your histogram. And really you should be doing both of these things. Why are we turning down the LCD? Well, if you're accustomed to shooting in daylight then your LCD is probably at the zero setting unless you've had some particular reason to go to minus one or plus one. But most people just keep their LCD at the standard factory setting right at that zero mark. There's no exposure compensation, so to speak, on your LCD. And that's fine for shooting in daylight. It's fine for shooting at twilight and uh, you know at dawn before sunset. Um, you know, at all of those times, it's fine. But where it starts to become a problem is at night. And why is that? Because when it gets dark out, your eyes get adjusted to the dark. And now anything that you look at that has light is going to appear brighter than it really is. So this is what happens is you've got your camera in this dark environment and you're looking at the LCD and everything looks fine. But the thing is, it's really dark because your eyes are dark adjusted. So if you turn your LCD down, now you're going to get a truer feeling of what that photograph is going to look like when you get it back in your computer. So everybody's got a slightly different control on their camera for how to do this. Um, I shoot with the Nikon D5 and I can go in there and I can dial my LC down, uh, LCD down to minus five. I usually go about minus four, sometimes minus five, depending on the circumstances. But don't be afraid to be aggressive about it. Um, and you know, try some different things and you'll get a feeling for what's right for your camera and for your eyes. Another thing you always wanna be doing at night is trusting your histogram. Night exposures are different. You're shooting in a dark environment and um, it's, ju it's just, you're not gonna get the same type of histogram as in daylight. Uh, but you can still use that histogram to make sure that you're getting a good exposure. Now, this might look okay uh, in out in the field, um, especially if I haven't turned down my LCD. But if I take a look at the histogram, then I'll see that all the information is at the left. That's all dark. There's barely anything in the midtones and nothing at all in the highlights. So while this might look good when I'm out in the field, once I get it on the computer, I'm going to see that this photo is just too dark. Now, yeah, I can boost it in Lightroom, but there's a, you don't want to boost your night photos too much. We're already shooting at a high ISO. So anytime you start increasing exposure or increasing your shadows in post-production with these high ISO shots, you're going to be introducing noise. That's something that Matt's going to talk about later. But if you could avoid noise to begin with, that's better. And this is a way to do it. Make sure you're getting your exposure right. So if I just look at my histogram, I can see that I've got a much better exposure here, right? I mean, just look at that histogram in the bottom right. Here we are, it's too dark, but this photo probably would look fine in the field. But by looking at the histogram on the back of the camera, now I can make sure that I'm really getting a good exposure and getting all that information into the dynamic range of the camera. Problem number four, my light painting looks flat and featureless. 
So this is something that you'll see a lot from uh, beginning night photographers. It's something that I did when I first started shooting at night. Um, and uh, we see it a lot on, on workshops uh, from beginners. And the issue is that a lot of people when they first start with light painting is they shoot, they light paint from behind the camera. And that's the solution. Never, ever light paint from behind the camera. The reason is that light that's going straight at the scene isn't going to create any shadow. And if you don't have any shadow, you're not going to have any texture. If you don't have texture, you don't have depth to your image. So this is the same sin as shooting with the sun behind your back, right? That's one of the first things we learn in daylight photography is don't put the sun at your back. So you also don't want to light paint from behind the camera because again, that light is just hitting dead on. So here's some examples. This is a standing stone in Scotland uh, where we happen to be doing a workshop this coming May. Um, and you can see over at the le left, I've got a little diagram for how I was light painting in different scenarios. So here it is without the light painting. And now if I light paint from the direction of the camera, you can see how, how flat that light is. There's a lot of texture in that rock, but you can't really see it because all the light is hitting it dead on from the, from the front. So you're not getting any shadow. But if I move that, let that flashlight just 45 degrees, now you can see how much more texture there is in that rock because the angle of light is creating shadow. So here, I'll go back. You see there's no texture. And here we've got a little. Now what I recommend is trying to get as close to 90 degrees away from your subject as possible with that light. So here's 90 degrees. Now you can see how much more shadow is being created just from that light coming at a different angle. And it's coming at a really extreme angle now, right? So it's just scraping across the front of that rock and it's creating shadow in every nook and cranny of that rock face. So that's why there's texture. That shadow is creating texture. You can also see how it's created. Uh, you can see how it's created. The, the light has created that shadow way at the right of the rock. And that's creating depth because now the whole subject isn't being lit evenly. We've got shadow on one part and light in another, and that creates depth. Now, if you want to get really extreme, try backlighting. You can't do it with every subject, but it works great with a standing stone. Uh, works really nicely with trees, sometimes bushes. So I always try to, no matter how much I've liked how I've done my lighting, I'll always try to do some backlighting too and see if I like that better. Because you can get, uh, you know, like you see that grass down at the bottom of the rock or even how there's kind of that rim light on the left of the rock. I love that effect. Now for this particular shot, I wasn't really happy with any one of those approaches individually. So I combined them for my final image. I'm light painting from the back and from the side. So now you can see I've got that nice backlit effect on all the grass in the background and the grass at the bottom of the rock. And I've got that nice texture from lighting from 90 degrees to the side of the rock. The most important thing here, no matter how I decided to shoot my final version, the most important thing is that I didn't light paint from behind the camera. Really easy to remember, get out from behind your camera, walk into the scene, walk around, get a side angle, and your light painting will look a lot better. Uh, this is a photo I did in Lassen Volcanic National Park in uh, California. This is uh, Lassen Volcanic is not one of the more uh, popular parks. It's definitely not a household name kind of park, um, but it's beautiful. It's one of the best kept secrets of the park system. There's uh, volcanoes, and mountains, snow, snow capped mountains and badlands. And it's a really incredible place. I very much recommend checking it out if you can ever get there. Uh, there's also some great rock formations. So uh, this is a volcanic rock uh, up on uh, one of the peaks. And you can see how much texture is in there. Now, whenever you look at a light painted photo, see if you can figure out what angle the photographer lit from. Um, in this case, you might be able to tell from the way that the shadows are cast that I was standing off to the left of the camera. And again, I was at a very extreme angle like in the example I showed before. So this is 90 degrees and I've got my flashlight. I'm using a Coast uh, HPR, uh, HP7R and then just kind of pulling that beam right down the face of that, of that rock. 
So that I get, again, 90 degrees, a lot of shadow, and a lot of texture. And then this is an example of uh, backlight. Uh, I mentioned that it can work really well with some bushes, and this is an example. Now, I had to get pretty far in the background so that I could backlight without being in the scene, because this, this particular bush isn't dense enough for me to be directly in the background. So I'm off to the left, far enough back so I can stay out of the frame, but still get a backlit effect. And I just love how the backlight creates all the shadows in the foreground that are just kind of sticking right out at you and, and coming at the viewer. Uh, so again, 90 degrees, backlight, those are my two sweet spots for uh, most of the time that I'm light painting. But again, number one rule, don't light paint from behind the camera. Okay, problem number five. The Milky Way, the North Star, the moon isn't where I want it. So uh, a lot of times you might have an idea of uh, maybe this um, a beautiful barn, say you're in Grand Teton and you want to shoot the molten barn uh, with the Milky Way behind it. Um, you say, well, the Milky Way's not there, or you want to get the, the moon rise or a moon set or a meteor shower uh, in the background of some particular photo that you have in mind. Well, when you get into the field, you've got 360 degrees of sky and horizon around you, and you might not be able to get that composition that you wanted unless you give yourself a leg up. And what we recommend is that everybody doing night photography should have photo pills on their phone or on their tablet and be using that not only in the field, but you can also use it at home before you go on your trip. And then you can give yourself a much better chance of getting these kinds of photos. Now I'll show you a couple of examples of things that you can do with photo pills. Um, this is a, a screenshot from a photo that Matt planned uh, back in 2016. Uh, there was going to be this amazing super moon that fall. And uh, Matt was in uh, Arches National Park at the time, and he was able to use photo pills to find a spot to shoot the moon coming up. Um, so you can see the moon rise was going to be at 457. There's all sorts of information here uh, that, um, that photo pills can tell you. Uh, you can see right up on top that it's set for uh, just outside Moab. So he's in the national forest here. Um, all the information you need to figure it out. Uh, but it's not quite enough. What you want to do is switch into the planner mode and then you can get the map view. Now you can do this again. You can do this from your, from your couch at home or you can do it right on site. Uh, and that's one of the powerful features of uh, photo pills is you can plan this shot six months in advance if you want. Uh, or you can do it when you're on location and say, okay, what's going to happen tonight? Uh, so just to give you a sense of what we're looking at here, over to the left is that pin is where Matt is standing. And from there, he can see that the, the moon, which is that, that light line that's kind of heading up toward about two o'clock, that's, that's the direction that the moon is going to rise in. And it's right over that ridge. So uh, Matt, you know, could have been tried somewhere else, maybe near the parking lot or a different trail or whatever, and he could have seen that the moon wasn't coming up any place interesting. Uh, but uh, by moving the pin around and looking at different spots in the satellite view or on the map, find a place where the moon is coming up over something interesting. In this case, this ridge. So all Matt had to do at this point is now he's got all the information. He knows what time the moon is rising. He knows where it's going to rise. He knows something interesting to put in the foreground, and he knows exactly where to stand in order to get that shot. All he's got to do at that point is show up and shoot it. And there we go. Nice job, Matt. I hit my space bar. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, Okay, did I explain that all well? Did I pretty much nail your process? Nailed it. Okay. Um, this is going to be, actually, if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, Jennifer Cordy is an expert at, I mean, her thing is shooting the moon. Uh, if you ever get a chance to uh, see her speak and go, go on one of her workshops, this is exactly what she covers, uh, mostly in the New York City and New Jersey area. And she's going to be speaking at the Night Photo Summit, too, um, specifically on this, on how to plan moon shots like this. Another really powerful feature of photo pills, um, you know, all that information is great and it's enough to plan, but I love augmented reality. 
Uh, this is a photo that Susan Magnano did of me. Susan is also speaking at the Night Photo Summit. Um, go figure. Um, and you can see if you if you look at the screen is uh, the photo pills is overlaying uh, a, a map, you know, a guide to the sky right over the scene that I'm looking at. So I can figure out not only where, I mean, obviously I know where the moon is in this shot, I can see it. But the point is, is that I can set the augmented reality for any time of day at any time of year and figure out where the moon is going to be or where the Milky Way is going to be, et cetera, et cetera. And then I can use that for planning. So, you know, say I was at this location at a different time of year and I wanted this photo, um, but the moon was in the wrong spot, I could see when it would be in the right spot and come back and shoot. And again, you could do this uh, with all different things. So that was an example of me using photo pills for the moon. But here's the Milky Way. This is back in North Cascades National Park, again, up in Washington. And uh, there's this beautiful overlook um, over one of the lakes and the mountains are in the background. Uh, some of the most impressive alpine scenery in the US. In fact, the uh, nickname of the park is the, uh, the American Alps. Uh, so I wanted to get a Milky Way photo and I was here in daylight and I could see, okay, that's where the Milky Way was going to be. Um, and this, again, this is using the augmented reality. And if you look, kind of tilt your head 90 degrees, you can see that it says the date and then the time, 2.30 a.m. So that's when I know at 2.30 a.m. the Milky Way is going to be right there. That's enough information to shoot, right? So I could say, okay, I want the Milky Way just coming out of those mountains if I'm here shooting at 2.30, that's what I'm going to get. And sure enough, it was dead on. All right. So we got there at about midnight. We're shooting, we're shooting, you're shooting. Sure enough, 2.30 is that's right when that Milky Way is coming out of that mountain peak. You can also use it for stars. Um, this is uh, right here uh, facing north. And those uh, circles, concentric circles, are tracing approximately what the stars are going to look like revolving around the North Star at the center. So this is at the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in, um, uh, in North Carolina in the Outer Banks, Cape Hatteras National Seashore. And I had the idea of putting star circles behind the lighthouse uh, looking up from this extreme angle. Uh, so where do I set up the camera? Well, I, you know, I could just show up at night and find the North Star. Um, that's no problem. But again, I like scouting in daylight. So I go during daylight and I use photo pills and I can figure out exactly where I need to set up my tripod to make this photo happen later. So you can see I was scouting at uh, 318 and I know which direction is uh, north. I know where the North Star is going to be. Um, I can figure out my composition. Again, I can look around and see is there anything in the environment that I'm going to need to to work around once it gets dark, and then I can come back and do the shot. A feature that PhotoPills added just uh, about a year or two ago is to also be able to use augmented reality uh, to plan a meteor shower photo. Uh, this is one of my favorite night photos ever, and it's uh, one that Matt did in uh, Great Sand Dunes National Park in. Um, uh, Colorado. Uh, Matt, I'll let you uh, explain how you went about this. Oh, Chris, for the compliment and the handoff. Um, so yeah, this, this was a, a dream shot of mine. This was something that I had worked hard and failed at prior. And we have a great blog post about that um, on our website, National Parks at Night. Uh, so what I did to not fail when we, we got to shoot this finally in, in 2017 was to use uh, photo pills um, retroactively. It came out after this. <laughs> this this feature, I wish I had it back then. Uh, what it really came down to was knowing where the Perseids was going to rise and how high into the heavens it was going to move and knowing the path or the trajectory of your meteor shower is vital when you're trying to plan which lens to choose, how wide it is, um, where you're going to focus, how much to compose bottom of frame versus top of frame. Uh, all of those things factor in and having this tool, this AR, to be able to, to map it out while you're on scene during the daytime helps you not only choose a safe place to be, 
uh, but the right spot to include foreground elements for an interesting composition. Uh, so, so this here, it's showing you that it rises just above the Sangre de Cristo Mountains to the north at about 10 p.m. And then at 11, it's, it's a certain point above that, and about 12, it's a certain point above that. And right after that, the moon came up. So I knew that that was my, the arc of my opportunity and that I was going to compose vertically. Uh, maybe we should go to the next photo and, and show them the result. So this is the result of two and a half hours of shooting, hundreds of photographs, uh, picking out certain meteors, uh, rotating them so that they came from the radiant, uh, from the origin of the meteor shower, and then blending in the moon kissed dunes in the front. Um, really a labor of love and patience and planning that otherwise wouldn't have been possible without tools like photo pills and specifically photo pills. Yeah, if you want to see uh, how much went into to, to making this photo, uh, we do have it on a blog post that Matt mentioned. And we also have an ebook on photographing meteor showers where uh, we walk through, you know, uh, how to plan, shoot, and do the post processing for exactly this photo. Um, but again, what we, the point we want to make here is about all the variety of things that you can shoot at night that photo pills is going to make easier for you. Uh, so if you are even remotely interested in night photography, and it's even good for day, daytime photography too, in so many ways, absolutely put photo pills on your phone. It's a $10 app, and it's going to be 10 of the best dollars you ever spent on photography. Right. It's a coffee and a half. <laughs> okay, Matt. I'm yes, going to sir. turn this over to you. So I'm going to stop sharing and you're ready to start. I am. Problem number six is this. When you start to take pictures at night, um, it's probably likely that you'll go for the low hanging fruit, which is the full moon. The full moon's a great opportunity to get out there and you take pictures because it kind of looks like daylight. You might be confused uh, because of many things. Um, but when it starts to look like daylight instead, uh, the one thing that you can do to fix this is to underexpose it. That's one of the solutions so that it's not a perfect histogram. Uh, give it a little bit of darkness, a little bit of mystery. And the other is don't set your white bounce to daylight. Set it to something more towards the tungsten scale. Set it to cloudy. Go into the Kelvin scale and set it there. And let me show you an example. This is an Arches National Park, and this is a perfectly exposed photograph with daylight. And that's moonlight hitting that beautiful sandstone, and those are definitely stars. So we have evidence that this is a night photograph. Great, but there's something about it. It's just like, well, where's the night in this photograph? So a solution that you could try is to change the white balance. And just that one change going from daylight to tungsten gives this a moody atmosphere, it gives this a more night-like appearance. And it might be uh, because we're not used to seeing full spectrum at night because there isn't really full spectrum at night. Reds are not as red. So if we were to show an image like this, it, uh, it feels and tastes false because that's not how we actually perceived it, even in full moonlight. It's a little bit more like this or somewhere in between. Another thing that you can do is extend the amount of time. And in this case, this was at least 20 minutes, probably half an hour. So I didn't change the color temperature, but I pointed towards the North Star and there's definitely star trails there. And Tim walked all the way down that trail with a flashlight. And you can see that little snake of light. He was illuminating the trail. So there's two pieces of evidence here that say, oh, well, this is not daylight. So I was just trying to trick the viewer with this one. They look at this and they say, oh, this is Wall Street. That's nice. Wait, those are stars. Those are the gotcha moments that I really love with night photography. Um, and, and other things where if the moon is overpowering, try putting it behind the object that you're trying to accentuate. Um, this is balanced rock, again, in arches. And 
this is a once in a lifetime shot. I had no idea this was going to happen. But I did know that the moon was overpowering everything in the scene. And I saw that the clouds were doing something interesting and we were catching a break. So I said, I'm going to have it crest a little bit over. You know what? I'm just going to open my shutter until the moon comes around the edge of Balanced Rock. And then I'm going to close my shutter. And that's exactly what happened with the fisheye. And the clouds were working in my favor that night. But what it doesn't look like is daylight, especially because the clouds are moving, the stars are moving, and you've got this beautiful corona. Um, so there's a lot of evidence there that it's not daylight. The next problem that we've identified that a lot of people talk about and constantly ask questions about is my night photos have a lot of noise. No kidding. We are stretching cameras to their limits. Even though they're limits, they keep moving the bar. Uh, it's still uh, a limit of quality. So there's a couple of ways that you can approach what's called noise reduction to night photography. And this happens primarily for two reasons. One is you leave the shutter open for a long time, or the other is you jack the ISO up so high that the amplification of that signal creates something. So those two kinds of noise are called long exposure noise and high ISO noise. And I'm gonna teach you to see the difference between the two of them very briefly. Long exposure noise is this. When you leave your shutter open for a long time, depending on the circumstances and the variables, your sensor can heat up and create what I like to call color confetti. These usually happen in areas or they're most noticeable in areas of shadow detail. Um, and they're really hard to get rid of because they can be prolific um, and they're very annoying. Let's take a look at, at a picture that Lance shot. Now, I, I dread using a picture of Lance's because they're usually perfect, but he, he uses this as an example of long exposure noise, so we nicked it for that. Uh, this is a Joshua tree, and we're going to zoom in on this long exposure, and you see the point on the wall to the right? There you'll find that color confetti that I was talking about, red, green, and blue pixels speckling the shadow areas, and this is because of a number of things, but primarily because of the duration of the shutter speed, how long it was open. How do you deal with long exposure noise? Well, we recommend dealing with it in camera on the scene and not in post-production. Because if you can imagine going into post-production and trying to spot each and every one of these pixels, <laughs> you're in for a nightmare edit, right? Uh, and we haven't encountered any software that's really good at cleaning this up. You could desaturate those pixels, but it doesn't get rid of the noise. It just changes their hue. It gets rid of their hue. So what do we mean by dealing with this in camera? We mean this. This means you need to, number one, be aware of how long, uh, when your camera breaks, when it starts to create long exposure noise. And that you can do with testing. We've got good blog posts on that on our website. Um, and the other is there's this thing that people uh, call shorten call Lenner, L-E-N-R, long exposure noise reduction. You can turn that in your camera and it'll take a second picture, sometimes the same amount of time without opening the shutter, find the hot pixels and subtract them from the final file. You can imagine um, that that is something that you need to plan for because if you take a half an hour exposure, your camera's occupied for an hour. So long exposure noise reduction is necessary when the temperature is higher, the ambient temperature. Let's say you're at 80 degrees, 90 degrees, 100 degrees. We have done that shooting in the desert at night. You're definitely going to encounter long exposure noise the warmer it gets. And oddly enough, the lower the humidity. Uh, and this is probably something to do with the electrostatic reaction. I'm not a scientist, but I know some theories. So it's probably when you combine those two things, it really gets messy and you're like, it's cold, but it's dry. Why am I getting long exposure noise? That's what it is. So you don't want to turn on Leonard all the time. You want to turn on Leonard specifically when you need it. Don't use it for tests. Don't use it for stacks. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the other bandit. The other bandit is high SO noise. Why do I call it a bandit? Because it steals your dreams. High SO noise makes people say, oh, that's not what I wanted. 
This example is extreme. Uh, this is in the desert. There's low humidity. And I set the ISO to 51,200. And we're in Valley of Fire. Extreme crop. What you're seeing here is not color confetti. You're seeing the opposite. You're seeing a regular pattern of noise, a regular pattern, an irregular pattern. It's a pattern of dark and light spots. I'm going to juxtapose this with a, something shot from the same scene at ISO 100 to illustrate the purpose. You see the huge difference between the two of them. There's a, much less of a pattern of noise on the shot to the left, shot at ISO 100, the native ISO of that camera, versus ISO 51200. This is high ISO noise, a pattern that makes your gradation from light to dark look ugly, and it makes your shadows look muddy. So what do you do for high ISO noise? Well, again, I must stress, know the limits of your camera. Go out and test it. I have some other great blog posts about that on our website at nationalparksatnight.com. So you should go out and test through your camera at different temperatures with different situations and build a library either on paper or in your head about when you know ISO, high ISO noise becomes unfavorable for you. In post-production, you can do some reduction of high ISO noise at the cost of clarity. In Lightroom, uh, there are these sliders um, under the detail section for luminance. You can play with those, but watch what happens. We have some courses about post-production we can help you with on that. Um, and then there's another piece of software that Lance recommends I personally haven't used called Noise Ninja. Uh, I have heard good things about it. But these two things that we talked about, high ISO no noise and long exposure noise, are two things that you will definitely encounter. They are boundaries. They're real. Uh, so like I said, the best thing you can do for high ISO noise is to know your camera. Test it, test it, test it. Uh, and then keep notes. Moving on to the next one, problem number eight. My Milky Way photos don't pop like the ones I see on Instagram. Well, here's what we say. Good, they shouldn't. <laughs> no offense, but there are some things that you can do to make them better. Now, I, in defense of Instagram, I'm going to say that that screen is small. The resolution is lower than a, a large, giant screen. And some people edit just for that screen. Uh, we like to look, take a look at the bigger picture and we like to say, what's your intent? That's a longer discussion. Let's just limit it to this. Here's an example. This was shot in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, or was this an Olympic? I think it was at Rocky Mountain. So uh, beautiful Milky Way core here. And this is crunchy. We call this crunchy because you can see every star and every star has equal importance and they're all bright and they're all sharp. And where should my eye look? Good question, right? It might be at the brightest thing, but there's other things on this scene that could be diminished so that your eye is drawn to the most important thing. And you could do that in post-processing. In a general sense, I'll just say that you should be using local adjustments instead of global adjustments. And that's a long discussion, but basically I used a brush and I customized it and I only touched the portions of the galactic core that I wanted to pull forward, that I wanted people's attention drawn to. And the results was this, which is more natural, which is more quiet and more of the experience that I had when I was out there versus the one that shouts on the left. This one on the right stands quietly and asks to be contemplated. The one on the left is like, look at me. You decide what you like more. But the problem that we see is that there's a, there's a huge contingent of people that are going a little bit too far. And we ask them to consider uh, pulling back a little bit on your edits. Problem number nine. Light pollution is ruining my scene. Well, this is more an attitudinal thing. We suggest use it. Instead of complaining that you don't like it and going someplace else where there's no light pollution, you're there, you got a tripod, you got a battery, you got some media, why don't you shoot it? 
Chris and I were out at Olympic National Park and uh, on the left is reservation that as you can see is lit up. And on the right are these beautiful rocks that we wanted to take a picture of. In fact, you can see my camera with my hat on it to the right. And my camera is taking this picture. That light pollution turned into the biggest softbox I could make. And I took this long exposure and between these two sea stacks on the ground, there's a whole bunch of birds hanging out on the ground. And then I've got this soft water without the light from that town. I could not have made this picture. It would have been completely different. So my opinion about uh, light pollution is why don't you try and find a way to turn it into an advantage, use it to your benefit and creatively embrace it. And finally, we get to problem number 10. The light, the clouds, the fog, the rain is ruining my sky. I expected clear skies tonight. What are you going to do about that? Well, this is another attitudinal adjustment, not a technical one. Employ creativity. Chris and I were also at Olympic on this one. And my gosh, every time we went to Crescent Lake, it was pouring. I wanted to get a clear shot of Crescent Lake. For the life of me, I couldn't because it was raining every single time. So I waited for the clouds to part and there's this rim road that goes there. And I specifically waited for some cars to come through and give me some light in the middle of the scene, which was otherwise too dark. And I looked out while that happened, there was a break in the clouds above. And because of my patience, I got not only stars through the clouds, but my deliberate choice of the car coming through gave me some definition in the middle of the scene. You go and you shoot and you plan that perfect time. Thank you, Chris, for this, where the water is just coming in or just coming out and you've got these beautiful sea stacks, but you don't get the Milky Way. Oh, shucks. What do you do? Well, Chris decided to grab a flashlight and climb up on the sea stack and turn into a human torch for us. <laughs> and, and his twist was he had a headlamp that he pointed towards the front too, to give him sort of himself some more definition too. And this is one of my favorite photographs. This is just the scale of this, of man versus nature. Um, and the opportunity to say, this is not ideal weather, but I can make something interesting with this was 100% attitudinal. And I, I have to compliment him on his vision for this. It was a great idea. I, on the other hand, went over to the right and I said, I'm going to do some light writing. So same place we have a little bit of light pollution off to the right that's going through. Actually, I think I had a Luxley Viola that was uh, coming across from the right and painting up that stuff. We just had it on 100 percent because it was like a half quarter mile away. And then I walked into the scene with some light painting brushes stuff and I started making shapes uh, that were just playful. So in the foreground, you can choose to be playful. And another, this is, this is one of my favorite shots. This was a Hail Mary. Chris and I were deciding whether to hike a mile and a half up the coastline to go to those sea stacks. And I said, I don't know what's there. Hold on a second. And I set this picture up to take up <laughs> for two minutes with my 70 to 200. And I ended up getting this painterly image. And it was, uh, it's it also one of my favorite things from this trip because it says a lot without showing a lot. And all I was doing was trying to scout whether we should walk up to see if the weather was different up there, but I ended up saying that this was a keeper image. And again, bad weather. You couldn't see a darn thing. A lot of people would pack up in their car and go home. We decided to walk up the beach after this picture. And then this photograph, um, great sand dunes, uh, across the valley, which is 50 miles wide, thunderstorms were rolling in. Not ideal weather to be shooting in, nor would I recommend shooting in dangerous situations. But that lightning storm could be as far as 30, 40 miles away. So I decided to take some really long exposures, get some star trails in there, and place that danger point all the way down at the bottom edge, creating some tension and some negative space. Uh, so 
this bad weather. I know this is an easy one. This is a softball. Lightning is a great thing to take pictures of, but only when you're safe. All right. So, um, yeah. So now um, I hope Chris can join me on screen. Um, that would be really great. Uh, those are our 10 tips. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, folks. Right, Chris? The, the 10 tips of the iceberg, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, funny. Yeah. No better way to end it than with a joke, right? But um good one with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna dive below the water level then and get into some questions. Um, let's start with going back to problem number four that you guys talked about. Terry Tao joining us from live stream is asking about the photo of the rock with the constellation. If you know a proximate settings, uh, shutter speed, ISO, aperture, all, all the good stuff on the EXIF side, uh, do you know generally, or if you can give us a good baseline, is there, is there a baseline that you guys start at for certain scenarios? Yeah, I, I could tell you pretty closely what that was. Um, because the stars are sharp. Um, so uh, last on volcanic is pretty dark. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of light, light pollution down in the bottom right on the horizon, um, uh, but it's a pretty dark area. So that exposure is gonna be uh, at about ISO, it's, it's ISO 6400 for sure. Um, and it would be F28. I've, I've got some depth of field because I'm using a hyperfocal distance there. And uh, it's gonna be at about 20 seconds uh, exposure. Um, so that's, you know, ballpark. I'd have to look at the EXIF data to see exactly, you know, it could be 25 seconds, it could be 15, um, but it's going to be right around there. And I know that because that's kind of the baseline exposure for a star point shot, uh, depending on how sharp you want it to be. Um, but uh, ISO 6420 seconds F28 is, is a good starting point for figuring out a star point exposure. Um, there's other variables, you know, depending on what the focal length of your lens is, uh, changes, uh, how much the stars appear to be moving in the scene. Like you don't, you know, if you're doing a start point shot, you don't want trails, you don't want little trails, you want to, uh, keep things sharp. So there are other variables, um, you can use what's called the 400 rule, uh, which is if you take 400 and divide it by your focal length, uh, this works for a full frame camera that'll give you your maximum shutter speed. So say uh, 400 divided by a 20 millimeter lens would give you a maximum of 20 second shutter speed before your stars start to trail. But again, even that's just a ballpark, it's a starting point. So you wanna, you know, you'll figure out through experience or through, you know, your uh, check, check your, um, uh, look at your LCD at the photo you did and zoom in and see if you're getting trailing in the stars. If you wanna get really precise, you can use what's called the NPF rule. Um, which is a really complicated algorithm that takes everything into account, um, including your, you know, what camera you're using and the sensor size and the focal length. And, um, you know, you need a computer to do it. Uh, and that's something that PhotoPills has built in. Um, you know, you can tell PhotoPills what camera and lens you're using and it'll tell you your maximum shutter speed before your stars start to trail. Uh, we did, Gabe wrote a blog post about that about two years ago. Um, but ballpark, ISO 6400, 20 seconds, F28, that's your good starting point for star point um, exposure. And that's, I guarantee you, that's almost exactly where I was for that shot. Perfect. So that'll put you right, right in the ballpark, as Chris said. Now, when it comes to cameras, I know we always talk about gear and it's like, well, the gear doesn't matter, but it does matter in certain, certain situations. Andrew's asking about DSLR versus mirrorless. Is there any, and, and I think if we can throw in also crop versus full, is there anything that makes one like, hey, this is really good for this? Matt, I think you should take this because you recently switched to mirrorless. Yeah, sure. How, here's how I feel about it. Um, mirrorless cameras have grown by leaps and bounds. Um, I think it's really important for, for people to really study what their goals are. Um, in this case, I chose to move to mirrorless because my needs changed. I presently own a Nikon Z6 and a Z6 II. I've started making more video. I've started live streaming. So my needs set grew, but one thing never changed. I still needed the best night photography camera that I could have that also could do 4K video and live streaming. 
Uh, so it ended up remaining in the Nikon Z family and the Z6 is the best for night photography that I have tested to date. Uh, so I can also do those other things like this is a Z6 II that was streaming before through my ASM Mini. But anyway, um, I think that it's, it's also important to understand what lenses are gonna work for you, um, how much you wanna spend on them. We generally like to get 2.8 lenses uh, not f4, not 5.6 for astro landscape stuff. Uh, you might want a little bit faster, you know. So you need to to look at what you can afford versus what you want to carry, uh, versus something that has the quality that you want. And we talk a lot in all of our educational materials about understanding the nuances of lenses. So it's the imaging system and the lenses. The lenses shouldn't have certain things like too much coma or any at all. And that's a really deep dive. Long story short. Um, there's a lot of innovation in mirrorless cameras and some of the camera companies are bringing that innovation back into the SLRs, uh, which Nikon did with the D780, right? So they basically took the cuts of a Z6 and put it in a D D750. Um, so the, it's, I don't think it's mirrorless versus, uh, DSLR anymore. I think it's just like what fits your needs. And some people can't stand the EVF. Some people can't stand the LCD and they want to look through an optical path. And I get that, you know? And Chris, I think you're one of them, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, 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 it's all a matter about like really being aware of what you need, what you like and what you hate and not participating in things that you don't like without good reason. Chris, I, I feel you on that. I was, always, I was a holdout for the DSLR age, but once I went mirrorless in the EVF, no going back. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, you know, I, I think right now, and this could change, but right now the technology in both is so good that you really can pick what you're doing based on, um, you know, based on other priorities, right? If you want to do night photography and you really want to be shooting mirrorless, there are some mirrorless cameras that are very good at it. Uh, the, the Z6 is probably the best one. Um, and, you know, but if you, if there's things about DSLRs that you like, uh, those are good for night too. You know, like I said, I, I shoot with the D5 and there's just, there's things I like. I like to be able to see through the viewfinder. I like to be able to shine the flashlight through the viewfinder um, because it, you know, goes out in the landscape. It can show me what I'm uh, composing. Yeah, it's just what I'm comfortable using. Um, so, it, it, you know, just, just pick the camera that you like based on the other features that work for the way that you like to work and then make sure it's good for nighttime photography. Okay. Now let's switch it over to uh, light pollution. We had a question from Willie asking about what you guys think on a uh, light pollution filter, such as those from breakthrough photography. And I think that's something we always hear that you have to get as far away from light pollution as possible. Can you guys break down, you know, is that absolutely true? Is there ways to cut through it with said filters or what do you guys feel on that? Well, you want me to take this one? Um, I'll tell you, I'm going to say something and throw it to you. Um, okay. we, we did a, a blog post series back in September about light pollution uh, because there's three primary ways to, to deal with it. Uh, one is in post-processing. Uh, Lightroom has some very powerful tools, tools that you can use to work with light pollution. Another is what Matt covered before about just being creative with it, You know, uh, which is usually what I do. I've got the philosophy of if you can't beat it, then use it. Um, but like you mentioned, there, there is the filter option and Matt has been really studying this a lot, uh, the past year. So Matt, why don't you talk about that? Sure. Sure. I've tested only two filters specifically. I've tested the IRIX, uh, light pollution filter, and I've tested the Benro light pollution filter. So I can't speak about breakthrough, but here's what I found out through my studies of this is that in certain cases, it's absolutely invaluable. Uh, and those cases usually involve uh, sodium vapor lights. Um, if you don't like how they look, if they are quote unquote ruining your scene, if they're so pervasive that you would like that color to be subtracted or muted in your scene, that then they're absolutely uh, helpful uh, because they just block that wavelength of light or the, those areas of wavelengths. And this is where the nuance is. The difference between those filters is generally how much of the spectrum and how selective are they in blocking certain kinds of light sources. Um, and 
sometimes it's, it's just testing and you don't know how old the lamps are near you or where you're going. So, um, so it's kind of, it's like a shot in the dark and per, you know, forgive the pun. Um, but I do believe that they're, they're useful. Uh, I do believe that they're, they're good in most situations. And on the other hand, there's a lot of post-processing things that you can do to minimize the effects of uh, disadvantageous light pollution, right? You can go in and change the hue of certain things. You can desaturate uh, in post-processing and just bring it down a little bit so it doesn't jump forward as much. So some of it you should do in camera if you're really critical about it or some of it you can handle during post-processing. Perfect. Now, I want to talk a little bit about light painting. We had some questions on that. Um, Ronnie is asking how long you're holding the light painting tool for, how long are you doing the actual painting versus the exposure? Um, and then we also had a question on, uh, on light painting as well from Mike, who's asking about uh, best types of light to use for light painting. Can you use anything at your disposal? What's optimal versus not so so good and do you have to use something with variable uh, white balance as well as variable brightness? Well in terms of how long you're exposing and how long you're lighting that is completely variable depending on the photo that you're doing. Uh, there's no magic formula for it. Um, it's uh, you know your process is basically figuring out what your amber ambient exposure is going to be so don't even add the light yet. Just figure out uh, what the scene's gonna look like in the camera. Um, and I like to shoot a little bit dark um, when I'm gonna add light painting uh, so that there's a notable difference between the light painted subject and the ambient scene. Um, so uh, figure out your ambient exposure, then go a little dark. And then you add the light painting. And how long do you light paint? Well. It depends, you know, are you shooting a 10 minute exposure at ISO 100? You're gonna need more light. You're gonna have to add more light at ISO 100 than if you're doing a 20 second exposure at ISO 6400. Uh, so that's what I mean about it's just, it depends on the shot. Once you figure out your ambient exposure, then just throw some light on the scene. You know, after a while you're gonna get, uh, you'll get a second sense of how much you have to add but I, I can't stress enough how much you learn just by trying it. Just throw some light up there and see what happens. Uh, we're blessed that we have these LCDs. We can go and look and see what we just did uh, and see, did we add too much? Did we not add enough? And then just adjust. Um, every shot's gonna be different. Um, and in terms of tools, uh, Matt, why don't, you, why don't you take that one? Whew, I mean, <laughs> infinite? <laughs> Infinite. Nice. I mean, I start out with with the Coast HP Seven R. I gel it. Um, it's and I exactly. Good. We've we've all sort of picked up habits from each other in this case because we have the benefit of learning from each other. It's the power of five, right? So we're blessed in that sense. Um, and if we get to yeah. So so what do you do once the light exits? The flashlight well you can cup your hand around it you can shape the light you can diffuse it you can bounce it off of something um you can use something like the lux of viola or the fiddle that is a something that's color variable right color temperature and color uh hue variable um it is a favorite of ours because prior to the fiddle it went down to one percent which is really important to us there's a, another kind of light painting called uh, low-level landscape lighting. It's just like drips in a bucket. It, it eventually fills up the exposure, right? So being able to choose your color temperature was vital. And the viola was, was really the first thing that we found that satisfied that need. And now with the fiddle, we can go down to a tenth of a percent, which is even better. You can make the drip even slower. Um, and so yes, it would be ideal. The flashlight doesn't exist that has color temperature control yet we've been begging for it and we've been wanting to work on it with somebody. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's something I'd love. So for now we just gel the flashlights and like, this is as deep as asking a portrait photographer, which light shaper would you use to light a face? Well, is this person young or old, they male or female? Like there's so many variables to it. Is it, you just got to think in terms of, is it hard light, soft light, or do you want direct diffused or reflected light? Once you start working with those sorts of things, 
then you get a feel for it. I would say nine times out of 10, we're using direct light. We're creating shadows. We're creating texture in night photography. And every once in a while, we'll bounce it off our hands to fill in the shadows. Long answer. There you go. Hey, long is good. Long is, uh, is informative. Now, Rebecca has an interesting question here. She says, at what wind speed should you just pack it up and go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> Is it really, is, is there, is there ever too much wind? Are, you know, are you guys fighting, uh, you know, holding onto the tripod or are you just packing it in? Uh, one of my favorite night photography memories is with Matt. We were in Rocky mountain, uh, getting ready for our workshop and we were up in the tundra. Um, I think the highest part of the park that you can drive to is uh, over 12,000 feet. And we were up there to do some Milky Way photo design because it's high enough. The air is thin and it's just crystal clear up there. And the wind that night was so crazy. I didn't shoot, but Matt had his tripod out and he set up and during a 20 second exposure was on the ground pulling, like all his weight, pulling the tripod down to keep it as steady as possible. And he got a sharp shot. So <laughs> I, guess the, I guess the answer is what you can tolerate. Um, but uh yeah, I don't, it, you know, the problem is that the, the wind is shaking the camera, which is not good for a long exposure. Um, yeah. So, you know, just you know, what can you tolerate um, and uh, still make a good image? Uh, and again, I, I mean, I can't stress this enough is if you can't beat it, use it. You know, if, if it's really shaking your tripod too much, then maybe do something, you know, do some deliberate blur. Um, you, you know, like you think about flower photographers who shoot with a breeze and then get that beautiful, yeah. you know, find a way to make it work. Um, you, you know, what's the alternative? Packing it up and, and going home and not doing anything? I'd rather be out shooting and yeah. find some image that, that yeah. I can make. I just had an idea, though. Uh, I'm rewatching all the Marvel movies. I think there should be a tripod a manufacturer that makes a tripod out of vibranium. <laughs> absorb all of the vibrations that would be amazing okay moving on if we don't get that done rebecca just bring matt along You're, <laughs> he's got pro proven results oh man now look matt i'm gonna keep it with you hadley has a question specifically for you matt any suggestions for making hadley's moonlight photo look more like night in post-production whether reducing the exposure by a stop or two using mm. tungsten white balance any other thing White balance is number one. Um, I did recommend before to underexpose, but here's, here's another way to look at it. You could properly expose and get all the shadow detail you want and get a full dynamic range exposure, you know, from, from wall to wall. Let's pretend, there we go, from wall to wall, and then shift the exposure during post-processing. You can crush the shadows a little bit if you want. Instead of starting from a deficit, a lack of information in the shadows, the only time that really doesn't work out is if you're light painting in the foreground. You still need to work with your ratios. Um, so let's let's go back to that. So yes, you can drift your color temperature from like 5,500 down to 4,800, down to 4,200, down to maybe 3,800. Those are nice jumps to make to see a qualitative difference in what looks like night. And it's gonna it's gonna depend on what how much moonlight there is, how much ambient light there is from humans around. So there's no set answer to what color temperature you should use. You need to cook to taste as if you're in the kitchen. Um, with the other thing, like I said, with, with light painting, then you need to be aware of, if you're adding light into the scene, you need to be aware of what your camera's set to and what you're emitting from your light source. Make sure they're the same or deliberately different so you know one's warmer than the other etc so that you can choose because a lot of times the things that are warm jump forward and the things that are cool push back and that's just color theory so that's why we often put a little bit of warm light in the foreground and let the background cool so you might set your camera to something like 3200 and light paint with something like 3800 so um yeah actually it's the other way around <laughs> paint with 32 <laughs> yeah and set the camera 38 anyway what you need to do is make sure that they're different um and hadley i know your name you're one of ours <laughs> we like you <laughs> great question thank that you that was a plant that was a plant <laughs> now <laughs> it wasn't a plant it's just we know hadley. how many hadleys are there 
Now, what about uh, high ISO noise reduction? Tony's asking about this. We hear about it all the time. All the cameras now have it. Do you guys use it or no? Recommend against it. I, I don't use it. Um, you, you're talking about in-camera high ISO in camera, yep. noise reduction. Um, I, you know, it's the, the Lightroom does a, a pretty good job of it. Um, and, you know, some of it's going to be camera specific, like Matt said before, test your camera and know its limits. Um, I, I, I don't use it. I'll use long exposure noise reduction sometimes when it's called for, but I never use high ISO noise reduction. Not in camera. I feel the same way. Um, I don't, I haven't seen any in-camera noise reduction that's better than what I can do in post. And I'd rather not destroy an image before I get a chance to use tools with more finesse. Yeah. You Definitely. want to destroy it yourself. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah and, and what the issue comes to, you know, Matt alluded quickly to it earlier is that a high ISO noise reduction is also going to reduce the sharpness of the photo. Um, if I'm doing that in post, I can watch for when it's happening and compensate it compensate for it with sharpening in post too. If that's happening in camera and getting baked in, uh, then I can't do that. So uh, just like Matt, I, I just want to have manual control over that later because I don't want to lose. I don't want something else killing my sharpness. Definitely. And the final question of the evening revolves around film photography, medium format, large format. We had a couple questions actually asking whether you guys still shoot uh, uh, film for long exposures, do you shoot in medium or large format at all? Um, well, Matt's about to answer the question for him. I'm go. gonna, I'm gonna tell you. We, we don't usually do this. I'm gonna mention um, our blog on Saturday morning. This coming Saturday is on this topic. So, if you are curious about night photography with film, uh, definitely check out our blog at nationalparksatnight.com Saturday. Wonderful. And, and Matt's showing you the goods right there. <laughs> Is it, you know, a lot of photographers used to pose for their, their headshots like this. Like, <laughs> yeah, this, this is the camera I use. Yeah. You know. um, this, this is one of my favorite uh, cameras to use for night photography, the Mamiya 7 II. Um, I still have three lenses for this. Uh, I used to shoot chromogenic film with it. I've, I have shot a lot of night photography on film. Uh, every format up to eight by 10. Um, and, and I do enjoy it. I have to be honest, I haven't done it in at least two years. But this weekend's blog post is from somebody who has been practicing it recently that we know who's close <laughs> to us. So yeah, uh, I, 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 because he inspired me, I bought batteries for my Mamiya <laughs> 7. And I have film ready, and I'm going to be making exposures with it because of him. So, yeah. Awesome. I think we can say who it is. It's, it's no surprise. It's the guy who owns every camera ever made, and that's Gabe Biederman. Yeah. That was going to be my guess. I think, I think that, was the, that was the obvious choice, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. And everybody out there, probably everyone out there listening or watching knows Gabe, so it's probably no surprise to anybody, right? Yeah. yeah, Gabe is the only person I've ever traveled with uh, who, for night photography, brought a wooden pinhole panoramic film camera and <laughs> set it up every time we stopped. <laughs> I can only imagine all the stories. <laughs> yeah. we, could, we could probably go through the night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do our That's own. Our we, we do a whole presentation okay. just on Gabe's cameras. There we go. Well, Gabe. You know, Gabe's always got his time to shine. Uh, yeah. You got the Night Photo Summit coming up, which you guys alluded to earlier. A ton of great photographers. Um, if you guys aren't doing anything, if you are doing anything, make yourself free for it because it definitely is going <laughs> to be something something worth tuning into. Um, somebody dropped a comment. Naomi's asking about free T-shirts for the Photo oh, yeah. Summit attendees. Yeah, every, every attendee yeah. can, can get a shirt. Yep. Naomi, you got your answer right there. The glow in the dark. Yes. The oh, glow in the dark. <laughs> yeah. That's how we roll. We're going to get a live demo of somebody trying to, to light paint with a, uh, one of their shirts. I don't know how well that'll work out. I bet you I can make this work. Uh, that'll be the next blog post. <laughs> Matt, my next time. With we'll, shirt. There we go. 
<laughs> so are we getting a live demo right Ta-da. now? Oh, almost, almost. I'd have almost. to turn on this display. There we go. Now it's hey. glowing. Hey. Oh, there we go. We did get a live demo. <laughs> hey. Wonderful. Well, you guys, this is awesome. Um, I mean, this is the perfect lead up to the Night Photo Summit. It's just a super, super, super fun topic to talk about. It's one that is way, way, way harder than it looks. You guys may really do as much explanation and as easily as you break it down and make it sound it's still it if you think it's easy go out there and try it and you will really have so much more appreciation from these two guys sitting in front of us right now because it it really is it's challenging to get great shots at night yeah that's 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 the fun come with us we'll make it easier for you there you go well, I'm gonna have to join you guys one night. It's definitely I gotta Please. I gotta do it. It's it's something yeah. I gotta I gotta increase my skill set as well. So I can't just be on here and talk about it and not uh not you know, practice it. So one day I will get out there. Hopefully I have something to show for it. Uh, you guys get your work cut out for me. But this this was awesome. Um, again, night photo summit. Don't miss it. Check these guys out. Make sure you shoot them a follow on Instagram. Check out national parks at night on Instagram, uh, website, all that good stuff. You guys know what to do. It's, it's so much easier in the internet age. Now it's like, just Google it, Google it. Everything <laughs> will come up, but I want to thank you guys again. It's always a pleasure having you guys on the event space, whether it's in person online, Thank you again for your time. Thank you to the uh, rest of the team at National Parks at Night, Night Photo Summit for helping make this all happen. This has been another wonderful rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. Y'all have a good night.